All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's CNCF webinar is titled Helping App Developers Adopt Kubernetes with Tecton and Argo Automation. Um, I'm uh, helping host this webinar. I'm Phil Estes, one of the CNCF ambassadors. And uh, interestingly enough, I actually work in IBM's cloud platform group as a distinguished engineer, and it's uh, kind of fun to lead off um, a webinar hosted by a couple of my colleagues in IBM. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Roland Barcia, who's CTO of Solution Engineering, and Sean Sundberg, uh, Lead Architect, Cloud Native Toolkit at IBM. Um, they both work in uh, IBM's garage, which they're gonna tell you more about, but it's really connecting a lot of these uh, great cloud native technologies that some of us work on in open source, some of us use. They're getting that in the hands of practitioners and developers and users. And they'll talk to you a lot more about that in a few minutes. First, uh, before I turn it over to them, a few simple housekeeping items. Um, obviously, this is a webinar. You're not going to be able to talk to our presenters today uh, as an attendee. What we'd love for you to do is use the Q&A box that's, that's there for you at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Uh, feel free to drop any questions in there anytime throughout the presentation. Uh, the presenters are going to try and, and keep an eye on that since there's a couple of them. Um, somebody can be watching for Q&A and they'll either deal with it in the presentation or, or type out a response to you there. Uh, if we see generic questions popping up in the chat, we'll remind you to go post them in Q&A just to make it easy on our presenters. Um, this is an official webinar of the CNCF, and therefore the CNCF Code of Conduct is in um, effect. And basically, uh, what we'd love for you to do is not add anything to the chat or the questions. It would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. And of course, that just means uh, be respectful of fellow participants and the presenters. All uh, CNCF webinars are recorded, uh, including this one. So uh, if you miss part of it or, or want to share it with others, uh, check it out later at cncf.io slash webinars. They're usually up pretty quick. And so with all of that, I would love to hand it over to Roland and Sean to kick off today's presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Thank you Phil. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, Phil did a, a great job kind of introducing our roles. Uh, just a little bit more. Um, as Phil said, I'm Roland Barcy. I'm also a distinguished engineer in IBM and CTO of our solution engineering team. Uh, I lead uh, a team, a, a, I'm going to say a tribe of different squads, really in the garage. We focus, um, we started about, I'm going to say over five years ago inside of startup community spaces like WeWork and Galvanize, and we kind of built out a methodology uh, to get to quick outcomes for clients, bringing together things like design thinking, extreme programming, lean startup, Spotify method, a bunch of DevOps and SRE practices uh, to, to get to quick outcomes, build minimum viable products, but do it in a kind of enterprise uh, production context. Uh, that includes building new cloud native applications to modernizing existing applications, and IBM, delivers a lot of solutions based on the really cool open source projects out of CNCF. Um, you know, a lot of emerging technology with Kubernetes and Tecton and Argo, which we'll show some examples of. One of my lead engineers is Sean. Sean, you want to quickly kind of introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm a, a lead developer here in Austin from our garage team. I've been uh, working in customer engagements for uh, all of my time here at IBM, long time at IBM, and um, within the garage have, have led a couple of uh, Kubernetes-based, uh, OpenShift-based engagements as well. Um, and lately I've been working on and leading a team uh, building out a garage cloud native toolkit that helps, um, that will help us uh, make uh, our developers more productive and uh, our projects more effective on uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, use the best of what's available in the tools. And we'll walk through some of that uh, here in a little bit. Yeah, and, and I guess some of the goal here is um, from a practitioner perspective, a consultant type role that uses a bunch of different open source projects with clients, 
Um, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you work with large banks, insurance companies, government companies, et cetera, there's always a mix of multiple open source and commercial products that need to be mixed together to deal with things like security, compliance, testing, um, and an automated pipeline. And there's always a level of risk, you know, do I start using new open source projects um, at the right time of maturity? Um, do I introduce one or two of them into a larger pipeline? And out of necessity, uh, working with our clients, we had to create uh, various different uh, ways of working, right? Do we go into a client and they're like, well, we have a Jenkins farm already deploying legacy things and it's doing our security scan and it's using a bunch of plugins. Um, and, and so we need to integrate that, but we'd like to adopt Argo to start managing our Kubernetes configuration. Um, and Sean is gonna take you through the toolkit, but I'm gonna give you as, as a CTO view, my engineers try to keep me out of the code because they're scared that I'm gonna break it or do something to it, but kind of give you a getting started point of view around Tecton and Argo. And so Tecton is, to me, is a really exciting project because um, it's first native Kubernetes, a lot of great opportunity to not only uh, it run in a cluster, but actually treat Tecton pipelines the same way I treat my application. And so the ability to define YAML, define infrastructure as code inclusive of that pipeline and being able to deploy that like an application, kind of pipelines for pipelines, it creates great opportunities for something like Argo to actually push out the pipeline itself. Um, Argo is another great tool from a perspective of CD um, and, and not just CD, but really GitOps and driving, you know, how clients uh, might be able to work with um, infrastructure as code. So developers, developers for a while have been used to having Git as the center of truth, leveraging CI, CD, doing continuous integration and deployment. Operations teams coming from a VM background have different degrees of comfort working in that space. So it's, it's you know, we work with kind of an adoption model there. And so a very simple example, and this is just kind of integrating two open source projects together and where you, I'm using OpenShift as my Kubernetes environment here. You, you can do this with any Kubernetes environment. But the idea here is build a, a simple application. I you know, grab the hello world from Node.js, um, you know, build out uh, and build out a pipeline out of, you know, Tecton artifacts and use Argo, which can be configured as an operator um, using the operator framework CRD onto a Kubernetes cluster, and then have an integration around, you know, taking Tecton, uh, having Tecton do build um, and publish of images into uh, an environment and then having Argo kind of drive the deployment of a particular use case. So we're kind of doing a couple DevOps flows and, you know, I did my own, you know, hello world example where we come in here um, and here's an example of, you know, a couple of things that you get with Tecton. So first of all, I have an OpenShift cluster here and this is the op OpenShift um, environment. And, you know, operators provide a great way of kind of installing capabilities and actually I can manage operators themselves through a pipeline. Um, but in general, since I'm installing some of the tools around that, you know, I've installed Argo as an operator and I've installed OpenShift pipelines, which is uh, a layer on top of Tecton that gives uh, some visual helps and some automation on top of Tecton and integration into the OpenShift Kubernetes environment. Um, and they give you th uh, a few different levels of things like cluster tasks, right? So integration into BuildUp, for example, which is another cool open source project for building out uh, container in images um, uh, as well as, you know, using things like Podman and other types of things and different levels of cluster tasks that we make use to. So, you know, from a pipeline perspective, you know, I can put together a, a, a pipeline, which is a template um, and I create some pipeline resources. So for example, 
you know, where is my Git project and where is my image repository? Uh, th this could be something like Quay, it can be Docker Hub, it can be anything. Um, and I create some hard coded ones because I want to be able to run a pipeline manually, let's say through there. And I can take a pipeline which are made up of tasks and I'm using predefined tasks here, which kind of show the reusability of Tecton, right? Where uh, I want to use a build the task to build and publish my image, maybe getting my base image from something like Quay, uh, my standard Docker file. Obviously this is a bad practice from a security perspective. And then other things that you can use from an innovation perspective, Argo CD, uh, an Argo CD sync task. So I'll get into Argo for a minute, but the ability to actually then take uh, and use Argo as a CD out of a Tecton pipeline. And so I should be able to take a simple application and a simple pipeline, and I'm gonna switch namespaces to an application node web project, and I have the pipeline already deployed and the steps, I should be able to take that pipeline and run it, and I'll do that in a moment. But I wanna get a little bit into Argo. I'm using visual side of Argo because it kind of demos better. Uh, there's a full command line interface to it where you know it, takes all of my deployed, so I have two applications. I have a node application, which I'm, I just talked about, Hello World, and I have my pipeline as well. And right now, Roland, then, yep. Sorry to interrupt, could you um, zoom in on your screen a little bit? Sure. Maybe a little more. Yep, thanks. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, you have the various resources defined. So let's, let's look at that, right? Um, besides the pipeline and the resources, the next thing is I want to trigger a build from the outside world, Most, a webhook usually from Git or, um, you know, GitLab and different, you know, different techniques for that. I'm using a very simple, you know, webhook for illustration around uh, Git push. Obviously, you know, you know, there's all different ways to do it with branching and tagging but a trigger template, um, and, and this is areas where, you know, I'm hoping the open source community drives to, um, you know, getting less artifacts to create, um, you know, things from the outside world, but there's reasons for that. A trigger template kind of gives me, you know, a, a, a way to define a template for how I want builds to run dynamically. So I, you know, I recreate some of the pipeline resources and I might want to uh, and I here I'm hard coding, but I could change, for example, the tag I want. I can grab the input from the webhook request and really do uh, a bit more dynamic things and then create a pipeline run um, out of these resources. And then there's an event. Um, that event ends up being a pod that runs in, in my uh, Kubernetes environment that's listening for, for you know, webhook requests and I expose it through a an open shift route. Um, you can use ingress, you can use node ports, whatever. Um, and then a binding to bind the template to that request. So binding the incoming uh, webhook request to the, the build. And that's a good decoupling practice because I might have different types of source control repos and I want to reuse pipelines uh, in a large organization. Um, and so these are different kind of techniques to do that. I've also configured some secrets, I won't show the secret. I have a template for the secret. I, I, you know, even though we talk about GitOps, probably Git is the wrong place to store secrets, credentials, probably want to grab that out of some type of vault environment um, and pull that from there. But the template of, you know, you know, where I connect to my server, user ID and password. And so I check all that in and you see that node uh, Argo CD is actually has my pipeline in sync, et cetera. Um, and and I, I can kind of make changes to that. So if I, um, let's see, if I make a, a, a quick change to, to, the, to the resource, um, it, it will actually go ahead and, and check if it's in sync. So let me, let me just pick something easy to change here. Um, so let me, for now, take out the tag, if I save that. Um, and then I'm gonna go into a, in my environment. I'm gonna commit that, I'm gonna push it. Um, if I refresh, 
and that's because I don't have automatic syncing. You see that it is now try automatically syncing uh, my pipeline over to my environment. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the change back. And you see that it's automatically syncing again. So uh, I can have a full out uh, pipeline for my pipeline. Uh, and that's a lot of great potential uh, from that perspective. Tools like Jenkins, other tools, they're great as well. There's a lot of different advantages to that. Some people are very comfortable with Groovy scripting and things like that. Um, you know, it's just preference. Uh, I really kind of like that. And then, so now I have that pipeline deployed. Um, I'm going to go into that project. And so the next change is kind of from a Tecton perspective, I showed my pipeline deployed. I have pipeline runs that have already been kind of kicked off. I'm going to actually stop those runs and um, take a look at the application. So from an application perspective, very simple, hello world, uh, you know, no JS, so I to kind of do this kind of CNCF. Now let's make it one, uh, about six, save that. I'm going to update my deployment as well. It's good to have, if you're going to have different versions to do things like canary testing, blue green deploys, it's good to have, uh, you know, very static um, type of deployment files for each deployment that you're really going to represent. So I'm going to go ahead and push that into an environment and you're going to, you know, instantly see a pipeline running. So that's going through my trigger and that's going to actually create a, a build and push it out. I'm not doing any tagging or testing. Um, you know, I'm going to get into that in a moment with, with Sean's demo. So I'm going to let the build complete. Um, and it should take two minutes. I kind of tested that, but you could see we can get access one to a few things. So, you know, OpenShift as a PaaS on top of a Kubernetes environment, out of a lot of interesting views around certain things. So from a developer perspective, I have my trigger and I have my node app running. Uh, I'm gonna actually go and, and you see this was the old version while I'm still building. Um, so I'll close that out. Um, and you can get a lot of different views. You could actually see if I go to my uh, Argo CD namespace, the Argo, uh, different things all installed with a single operator, uh, including my Argo dashboard um, as well. Uh, you see things are, are syncing up again. Uh, what's, what's interesting is Argo detects actual pipeline runs and it detects it as out of sync, even though it's, I, I needed to put an ignore resource um, in there because pipeline runs are probably things that are gonna, you're gonna have a lot of them. Um, and as you're executing those builds, I kind of go back uh, to my administrative view and, and look at my pipeline. Uh, you notice that it's, it's creating, um, and go back to my namespace. It's creating that pipeline, but it's also creating dynamic pipeline resources. Um, so if I, if I kick it off, from the web console, I have some statically defined resources or I can input them in. But if you wanna be able to track the type of resources together with the pipeline run, uh, you can do that. So here are the two stages. It's doing my build and my push. Um, my Argo sync should happen. Kind of the zoom thing gets in the way. So let me go back to my, to my project. You see that it's already detected. Uh, that it's out of sync and a sync is going to be executed very shortly. Let that finish. And now you see that it's completed the build stage and now it's going to actually go in and detect that the node deployment is out of sync and it's actually going to go and put things back in sync. So if I go back so my developer view, hopefully, things it's actually, you see here that it's ramping up uh, my pods because I had three replicas. And if I go out, you see, hello, CNCF, hello, new pipeline, 1.1.6. Uh, so the, the goal here is, you know, this, 
there's quite a bit of work in integrating these things. And, and so, you know, one of the things that we work a lot with our clients from a garage perspective is this notion that, and I'm going to hand this over shortly to Sean, is this notion is it's never just two tools, right? It's always a mix of things, right? You get into things like Helm, you get into things like an op stack. Um, and one of the things that my team is focusing on is really coming in and, and saying, hey, you know, what is the tools profile for a particular project? Well, you know, how do we bring these together? How do we integrate them? How do we do that so we can get development going quickly and not be tough coupled to certain clouds um, or whatever, right? Whether it be any, any, any type of cloud platform doing it in an open way. Um, and so this kind of gives you kind of an intro and an overview of kind of how you can use Tecton and Argo together. And I think now I'm going to hand it over to Sean to start sharing and talk a little bit more about a, a showing a fuller demo of a pipeline stack. You're up, Sean. Thank you, Roland. Let me share my screen. All right, so um, as I mentioned earlier, kind of in, in the introduction, we've been, and as Roland mentioned as well, we've been working on this Cloud Native Toolkit um, to help stitch together these tools. Uh, there are a number of tools, I know this, this group knows better than, than anyone, just the landscape of the, the many different tools, the different options, how to put them together to make a solution. So we've, um, we've put the tool to get together as a starting point for um, initially to help uh, uh, get our development team up to speed with building containerized applications. Um, and then it turned, it has turned into a, a, something we use for projects to accelerate our projects. Uh, the way that our projects work in the garage, not that different from uh, many others, but we work in an agile way um, using lean startup, and other um, approaches where it's very data-driven um, decision-making. We, we come up with a hypothesis at the beginning. We have a very quick um, MVP that we build to prove that hypothesis, maybe uh, four to 10 weeks. And um, we really don't have time to, to spend, a lot of, um, spend a lot of time building out an infrastructure and making these tool choices and making them work together. So um, this toolkit helps us to um, to do that rapidly, we start with a default set of tools, and then we work um, to customize it uh, based on the environment. So, in an environment where there are no tool choices or where they're new to cloud native, um, you might just take all the defaults. Uh, but then we can we can make choices on top of that. So this is all done open source uh, that that we're building. Um, this this page is for our developer guide that gives a lot of what I'm going to go through. It'll be kind of a walkthrough of what's found here in this developer guide. Um, there is the, the link here at the bottom to the, the Git org, GitHub org that has all the other content. Um, and so when we start, we're really looking to build an environment to support uh, DevOps and best practice DevOps in containers. So building containerized applications within the container platform. Um, we support Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, to be able to run these tools. And then with each type of tool, there's continuous integration, there's choice uh, amongst those. And we've started, you know, we are, ourselves are working in an MVP approach where we start with the common ones and then um, add on as we encounter them or, or through community contribution to get uh, more tools added. So you know, some of the, the basics, continuous integration, code inspection, contract testing, uh, continuous delivery with Argo, um, or uh, it could be done with, with Jenkins or Tecton as well, but separating those out conceptually, artifact management and uh, the image registry. Uh, and so we've, um, we have a set of automated scripts, te uh, Terraform scripts to provision this environment. Once you make your tool selections, lay down all of the tools and hook them together through uh, um, through config maps and secrets within the, the, the container in, environment so that the pipelines know where those tools live and how to connect to them. So then we can get up and running quickly. So 
we'll walk through one where I've already set up the cluster. We have Jenkins and Tecton both there um, uh, using Artifactory, um, Jaeger, Packbroker, SonarCube. So we'll we'll walk through uh, that environment and see what the, the development experience is there. We've also, as a part of this, created two other components, um, a CLI to help smooth over some of the some of the more complex pieces, um, particularly for developers that are used to a, maybe a, a more um, PaaS-like environment. So just simplifying the interface and the access to the um, to the tools. And then a dashboard, which is a similar thing to help bring to the developers, surface those tools, surface the uh, activation links and some of the other components. So with our container, with our tools in place, um, first thing I'll do is uh, look at the dashboard and we've, we've integrated, okay, we've integrated our, um, our CLI as a plugin to Kube Control and the OpenShift CLI. So it takes us to the dashboard. You can see here some information about the cluster, um, the version and the type, uh, the resource group and region some of the for the IBM cloud where that's located and, and which image registry we're pointing to in this case we're using the IBM cloud image registry but that could be the internal in cluster registry or some external one as well and then the tools that have been installed here um, we'll be going through an example with Tecton and Argo uh, using Artifactory as our Helm repository so that our default pipeline um, will package up your Helm artifacts into a Helm repository in Artifactory and use that to deploy SonarCube for um, for security scan or for, for code scan and code quality scanning, pack testing for the contracts, and then Jaeger for the the end-to-end -end trace. So um, we also, as a part of this dashboard, surface some activation links, some Catacoda and other content to help educate and bring the the team up to speed on the technologies that we're using. And then we provide a set of code pattern starter kits for um, getting up and running quickly. If you have, uh, you know, starting a new project and you or you're working in a particular technology, uh, we also give the ability to, if you have your own starter kit that you prefer or you have existing code, to be able to enable that code um, by laying down some uh, a Helm chart and a, a Jenkins file. So that it will build, um, it can be run in the pipeline. So, if we take the example, we'll start with a, um, we'll make a TypeScript microservice. So, if I click this, it takes us into the um, the repository where we have this. Again, it's all public GitHub, and uh, we're using the templating engine that's available in um, in GitHub. So, I can pick my my org. and create my repository. So this will, the templating does a, basically a fork, but squashes all of the history. Um, it still gives me the link back to where it was generated from, but it gives me my own copy of this to get started. Um, so I'll, I'll clone that down. And now I've got my own version of the application. I could um, I could run locally, but really what I want to do uh, now is, is get that into a pipeline. Um, I need a namespace first. So uh, we give this uh, this command sync, which essentially it creates the namespace or the project if it doesn't exist yet, but it also synchronizes the pull secrets and sets it up um, with the config maps that describe where all the tools are. Um, so I can set that up and get my um, get my environment. Now it's ready to go. If I go back to my dashboard, I can look and see. Within the OpenShift console, I can see my pipelines here. So I've got my namespace, it's ready to go. Um, so the next thing I'll do 
Is I, I need to register my pipeline. Um, I'm going to use Tecton. So we're, we already have Tecton installed because the tools were installed. And I just run pipeline, a pipeline command. Uh, it will ask what type, since we support both. In this case, we want Tecton. And um, it's going to read. Well, first it's going to set up a resource that what Roland just showed, it's going to show a resource that contains the Git information in it. So it read from the from my local file system, which repository I'm connected to. I tell it which branch I want to build off of. Um, and then it's going to read, we have some template pipelines that have been created. Um, and so it's going to read those from the environment. And ask which one I want to apply. Since this is a, a node-based application, I'll pick our node pipeline. And so it's, it has created the um, pipeline resource with the Git repository, a pipeline resource for the image. And now it has created a pipeline, as you can see here, a pipeline. And uh, as part of that kicked off the build with a pipeline run. So it is going to, um, is going to run through and uh, build the stages of our build. So you can see there's a the build and test. Since this is TypeScript, there is a build stage where we do the the transpiling of, of the TypeScript. We run our unit tests. We have the pack testing um, that if if the repository has any pack tests, uh, the contract testing that it includes, they will get executed. If not, it'll skip. It does the sonar scan run. We tag the release in Git. So we, we're using Git as the source of our versioning. So using Git tag. So it, when the build runs, it reads from Git if there are any tags that are available. Um, if there are, it takes the latest and increments it and then adds that tag back to the Git repository and uses that tag to version the Helm chart, to version the image. Um, so they're all tied together. It also means that um, our build process is completely ephemeral. So if our if we kill the this you know Tecton instance, if we we kill the Jenkins instance, and then we recreate it, we'll pick up our builds where we left off. Um, so this will run for a little while. Um, while that's running, I'll show you the tasks. Just um, that, now, this is a Git repository that's part of what's linked in the dev guide. Um, so, so this, and I, I see there's a question, you don't need OpenShift um, for this. We support uh, code-ready con um, containers. So if you run code-ready containers, which is OpenShift uh, on your machine, you can run all of this there locally. Now we have a cut down version if you're running locally because you don't need as many resources and there's some parts that don't make sense. Um, you could also run it on a Kubernetes instance as well, so Minikube or uh, another uh, Kube service. Um, so this is the task. This is the nice thing about Tecton. Um, let me make this a little bigger in case it's too small. So the nice thing about Tecton is it's very modular in terms of the tasks. Um, we are able to build both Java and Node um, and reuse many of the tasks that are part of that process, right? So the between the Java and the Node pipelines, we differentiate on the build phase because obviously to build the Node is very different than to build Java. And even this is Gradle, so to build Maven would be different even still. But once you've built it, to build the Docker image, and we're using um, Builda to do the build. Um, to build the, the Docker image, go down here. Um, that logic is the same, or, or your con container image, I guess. So that, that logic is the same regardless of what uh, the source is. So that is now generic task that's reused. Same thing for deploying into the cluster. That's a shared task that we use. Now we for the packed verification, 
that's specific again to the platform. So we, we vary there, but pack using the Helm chart and GitOps, um, those are, those are all common, um, regardless of the language. So we were able to reuse those tasks quite a bit and, you know, we compose those tasks into a pipeline. So these are the template pipelines that we chose from earlier. We make our own copy into the namespace. So that's, um, so the, we create our own copy of it here. So um, as a part of that, I have one that's been built before with some components. Um, so again, as a part of that run, we are doing a sonar scan. Uh, we're doing packed verification. So this one uses a little packed verification. Um, if I go back here, so and packed, uh, if you're not familiar, is a contract testing framework so, uh, to be able to model your APIs and then validate them between the consumer and the provider. So this is um, the, a BFF consumer and a, a provider, uh, the contract defined between them. Uh, um, and so you can define these, basically it's just a contract is a series of interactions. Each interaction is when I send this information, this is my expected response. And so we see um, that this ran, and in fact, there was an error in validating the service the last time this ran, um, and it it would have it failed the build of the service at that time. This is a different, I have a couple of versions out here. So this is a version uh, different than the one that we're looking at, but it it will validate and prevent you from deploying broken uh, or code that breaks the contract between the consumer and the provider. So we're validating that with each deployment. Um, we're also doing using SonarCube uh, to to look at do a um, code coverage scan, look at duplications, and we have gates quality gates on. Um, it's set by default on new code, so any new code has to meet a standard in terms of coverage. So we have there's an example from a different build here that failed because the new um, the new code had a code coverage is 74% and it had uh, some duplicate code in it. So it failed the build because of the, because of that. Um, so you could, we're enforcing that quality. And again, it can be configured based on the environment. We have some defaults. Uh, we're also, you know, essentially we're using the open source version of all these tools as a starting point, but that can be, um, that can be updated. Uh, with a licensed version and get full features. Um, so similarly, we're using Artifactory as our Helm repository. So as the as the build progressed, we deploy it to the de our CI environment to validate if it's valid. Then we publish our Helm chart into the Helm repository. Since this is the open source version, we are using the local storage, generic local storage. So this is one you see that it built. Um, and this is the, the Helm repository, the version that was built uh, previously, or I guess I think that's still in progress. And then the ones that were built, um, again, as the for the inventory that we were showing. So it's it's based on the tag. I can go back to that repository and, and validate that tag against what was built. And this is what gets deployed into the environment. Um, and then there's the the last stage for GitOps, which is essentially, um, so I've linked here. So it's it's essentially hooking into our GitOps repository that was configured, that was created previously. So for each component, um, the build, what it's doing is updating. Since we're using Helm, we have a reference to the Helm chart that was built as a part of the um, part of the process that Helm chart includes the image version that matches the, the version. And so the automated build is just updating the version number with each build that occurred. So it gets incremented that kicks off a deployment in Argo into our test environment. And then we have, uh, so it's this test branch is the default. Uh, and then the staging environment is, is handled through uh, the staging branch. So we've opted in this case to use kind of Git flow as the approach for um, for handling versions across environments so that we can use 
things, standard things from Git like pull requests to promote changes from one environment to the next. So we've got the deployment uh, into, so you can see there's a different version of the UI in staging than is currently in test. Um, and so that all got deployed into Argo. You can look and see. So we've, each component has been deployed into both the test namespace and the staging namespace as separate uh, applications. So if we look at any one of these, we can see I mean, this is a fairly straightforward uh, application at this point. Um, we can see the deployment and the pod. There's one pod there. With each new build of this, it will get refreshed. Um, and this is all set to auto sync at the moment. So if I were to change, so this is our test BFF. Um, if I were to change our BFF, uh, and again, we're taking the defaults at this point because it's simple, but um, you know, whatever custom configuration to the Helm chart uh, would be required would be added here in the values file. So it would be whatever varies by environment would be updated here and managed uh, as a part of that process. So um, let's upgrade the replica count. This is an easy change to make. Now, typically in a, in a real environment, you'd let the auto scaler do this, but for purposes of the demo, um, this works pretty well to show just how, um, again, in this GitOps environment, Argo is, is watching. Um, so if, I, I'll, if we waited, it would automatically sync. I'll go ahead and sync it to have it find those. Um, and so it will detect that there was a change and then see that it's out of sync and it will bring it into sync um, just like that. So with each deployment, it is, it is uh, going to synchronize the changes and see that a new version is available and push that version. If there's new config available, it would change, it would push that. And then we can use, again, the, the value of GitOps, we can use Git pull requests and, um, and change management to manage those changes across the environments. So then um, last thing here I'll show is the Jaeger is also installed. Um, I've got a, a simple example. Um, a lot of these are the, um, the health checks that I can filter it down. So you can see the, so in our UI of what's built, this one. So in our UI that's built, we're building uh, the, go back to the console. We're building uh, a UI component, a BFF that is GraphQL and uh, a Java Spring backend application. Right now it's not connected to uh, a particular backend, uh, but we, um, in this case, for the purpose of the demo, we we're using a canned response. So we can, um, with the starter kits that we provide, we Every one of them has Swagger UI that it provides. Um, and by default, the ingress is turned on so that you can see it. Uh, so we can, we can look at the data coming back from our, our service. Um, it, this, the Swagger UI, the open API UI can also be used as a part of the contract testing. Um, we can also, for the BFF, it's it actually supports both REST and uh, GraphQL. So I can run those same queries with GraphQL. And it, it has built in this nice playground to, to, to use to try it out. So you can see those are the same items that were being returned from the service were connected through. And then, um, and then the UI, and it's a very simple UI, but returning those same items uh, that are going through the BFF. So we can, we've validated each level um, what's happening. And then 
we're also showing in the topology, we can look at those components. And this is a OpenShift feature, right? That's not currently available on Kubernetes, but uh, for developers, a nice view of what's been installed, what are the relationships between the components. In this case, you can see we have our UI, we have our, um, our BFF, we have our service with a link into um, each of those components and uh, a link to the, um, a link into either the source code, the repository, in this case, Code Ready Workspaces is installed. Um, I was having a storage issue, so I don't, I think it resolved, but we'll see. Um, so we can launch into the workspace and see, uh, see the code running there, right? So it's direct access into web-based development. Um, so uh, BFF backend for front end. So it's a architectural pattern. In this case, we used it um, more as an example of, of building a three tier application. Um, and how the components will work together. But so the, the idea is for more uh, complex applications, it's a little bit overkill in this case since it's one service and one UI. Um, but you know, if you had a, a BFF that or a, a application where you had multiple backends, backend services that needed to be um, aggregated or brought together, where you perhaps you know there's a large payload coming from the back end and you only need a handful of fields, instead of sending that all the way back to the front end, you have a, a layer in between that, um, that works with and, and massages that data to fit the UI. So that's where GraphQL actually works really nicely um, in terms of refining the data and not having to code that into the, that layer, but letting the, the query that's being sent do that for you, and also aggregating multiple calls. Um, so how is this toolkit different from Jenkins X? I, so we use Jenkins, but um, we're tying together some of the tools, some other tools that that um, that are used, like security scans and um, some of the others. This is you know, so we're incorporating Twistlock and Aqua to do some security scans. Um, but you know, leveraging those platforms and providing some um, some basic out of the box uh, pipelines that provide some of the more uh, advanced features that most of the time you get kind of a hello world, if anything, out of the box. The other part of it is how all these tools got here, the automation of provisioning um, of those environments and to get um, all of the pieces together. So that's, um, you know, we're, so we're leveraging Jenkins in the container um, where that's being used because we have a lot of customers that are still using Jenkins and they're familiar with it and comfortable with it. We and still I, have some. And I think gone from a Jenkins X perspective, which leverages Tecton, right? Mm -hmm. um, now our goal is to bring together a set of tools, not just DevOps, right? But also the ops side. So things like Jaeger and Elk stack or an EFK stack or, you know, um, Grafana, Prometheus, the full life cycle of a project. And then we go into a client like Sean talked about and client X says, you know what? I have a standard, I'm using Nexus instead of Artifactory for a repository, and I'm using these test tools, and I'm using all these different tools. Um, and so this, the problem is broader than just who orchestrates the build or who orchestrates the build and the tests. It's, it's kind of a broader issue when we go out and work in the field, if that makes sense. Um. And there are multiple deployment models that we'll use if Jenkins is on premise. Um, and so, so the question is beneficial to hide Tecton. Uh, so there's a, I know there's some debate within even just the toolkit itself, right? Uh, um, our, the goal is to help facilitate projects. I find if you try to hide details too much from people, you, it eventually, you get yourself in a bad way. So, you know, by using the toolkit, we're not absolving any of the developers from understanding the containerized applications or even the, the DevOps environment. Somebody needs to understand it. Maybe that's your SRE on the project and developers don't need to focus on that as much, but, um, but there still needs to be a fundamental understanding 
of um, of how everything works. The the goal is to to borrow a phrase that's popular now is to kind of flatten the curve for learning the environment to get up and running and learn as you go. Um, so I think there's still, you know, we um, we still give you enough to get started. You know, like I said in our projects, we don't want to spend four weeks just piecing the parts together and and be able to to then be productive. We'd like to figure, you know, make those tool selections up front. We, in our process, have a um, have a discovery where we we lay out these are the tools that you, you know, as a customer that's already using and we want to continue to use. These are the tools that are new that we'll incorporate and and get all of that set up so that and we call it um, we call the that part the provisioning part iteration zero um, because iteration one is when you start the project and do work. So we like in iteration zero to get all of that installed and then in iteration one day one uh, the development team is already writing business logic and not infrastructure plumbing. Um, but at some point that you know you can't hide um all of the details so somebody somewhere has to know now you can um there are some things happening within tecton itself i know that that help make that easier to hide the details or to, to make the visualization of the pipelines better um but that's the nice thing with, with tecton in particular is the modular nature of the tasks it's, as long as you've got a good understanding of what they do that, that you can plug and play. Um, so the, um, so the, I guess there are two questions. So open source, so everything here is open source. The, there are no licenses required um, apart from getting yourself a cluster. Um, so that's where you can use CRC or you can use, um, you know, uh, get a cluster from somewhere. But from that, from after that, all of these tools are open source uh, versions of everything. Now there are paid versions of, you know, licenses that you can get for most everything that we're using that gives you either additional functionality. So Sonar Cube out of the box for open source version, you get most every um, scan uh, language that at least that we have needed. Uh, Swift you have to pay for and some of the others. Um, Artifactory, there's some paid features, but everything, everything that I just showed is open source free versions of everything. Hey, Sean, can you talk yep. about um, and one of the goals of the project is someone, let's say, says, I want to use Nexus instead of Artifactory, right? How would I plug the tool I use for my project? Right. So there's, there's a, a tool selection up front um, in the, and we go through that in the administrator guide how to get the environment up and going, how to make the tool selection. So part of that would be picking, say Nexus over Artifactory would be the matter of a, a tool choice. We've, um, if there is a module that exists already in some cases, in many cases, we have the alternatives already there. In the, the provisioning, you would just pick one over the other. Um, and then in, in the, when it gets provisioned, we, we set up the, configuration differently so the, the pipeline would know where that comes from. If there's a tool that doesn't exist that you'd like to use, um, that's where the, you know, we, we have some examples of how to provision. A new one could be added and it would be great to get some of those contributed back. As I mentioned, you know, we went with the core set kind of an MVP model that we, we encounter most often. Um, and in the case of Argo, we went with that because it, it has been um, at the time, it was fairly new, but it was the one that had a lot of buzz around, a lot of interest, and it's proven to be uh, a great tool for using um, in this manner. Uh, so, so there's those tools can be plugged in, and there's some configuration that that would incorporate it, and then there's a a model for you know how to build your own and contribute. So I, does that address the, the question, Roland? Yeah, perfect. And I think we don't have any more open questions. There's about three minutes left. So unless there's one more question, um, let's see if there's one more question. If well, not, start, go ahead and you have something and else. And I'll just make one more point. I've, I've focused very much on the developer story, but um, we also, part of our, um, part of our objective in, in building, you know, the MVPs, we don't want them to be, they're quick, 
and we're trying to prove a particular functionality, but the goal is for that to be production ready and to go into production. So build to manage is part of what we, uh, what we do. So logging, monitoring, which, uh, you know, we would get installed as part of the platform day one. Um, and within the, the, you know, starter kits and the code that's built, thinking about those things from the beginning um, and, and not leave that to the last minute. And I think that's why incorporating things like JMeter and making perf you know, performance testing part of that uh, early as well. So it's, it's not just about the developer experience, but there's a whole SRE journey that's part of this too, to help build applications that can be managed and run uh, well in production. And uh, the last question, it's, it's a pretty loaded one. Uh, any life lessons from DevOps world? I guess there's a lot of lessons, right? <laughs> um, to cover in, in one session. I think that, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios that clients work with. Some people want their DevOps outside of the cluster because they're doing it across multiple clusters. Some people want to leverage managed versions of services that exist. So, you know, we kind of detect and use what's there. You know, the, the last piece where, you know, giving you where are all my troubleshooting logs and all these things are important. Um, I mean, there's just tons of lessons. I don't know, Sean, if you have any final words. Yeah. Well, I'd say in this space, um, the development space and the, the UI, there's a lot of opinion. There's, there's less, not as many in DevOps, but there's still quite a few. So the, the tool selection, that's where we try to be um, somewhat open, but there's still some principles there that have kind of formed, especially in a containerized environment where, you know, your, your CI pipeline is separate and distinct from your continuous delivery pipeline, whether you're using something like Argo or not, you still make them separate because in this model, your CI pipeline is building a versioned immutable image is packaging up some, um, you know, Kubernetes resources. In this case, we're using Helm. You can use other technologies, but, um, but keeping that separate, you know, there's, it gets problematic when all of that is, is part of the, um, part of the same build doing the, you know, the, the image scanning um, up front at the time of build, but also periodically or continue at deployment time and in the cluster is important because um, even through doing building out this toolkit, things age fairly quickly just sitting on the shelf, right? So there's a lot of monitoring and, and validation that has to be done um, throughout the life cycle of the code. Okay. All right. Thank you. Phil. Uh, yeah, I think we're at the top of the hour, maybe a minute past, but lots of great information. Um, thanks so much to Roland and Sean for their presentation. Uh, lots of questions got answered as well. Uh, so that was great. Uh, and of course, given we're out of time, um, that's all we have time for. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I know some folks showed up late and we're hoping there'd be a recording. Uh, that will be online later today. And we look forward to seeing all of you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thanks.